Master's in Public Administration and Development Practice student at SEPA, and I'm representing our team, all of whom are also MPA students at SEPA. We worked with a client, it's the Wikimedia Foundation, who are interested in kind of seeing how the enormous amount of information that Wikipedia has available could potentially be used um, kind of in under-resourced settings. Um, and there's this really exciting new innovation in technology, which is this kind of offline internet. Um, we have a device that actually 30 users can connect to within kind of the same range as uh, Wi-Fi, which is really exciting in places where people don't have reliable internet connections or even access to electricity. So um, we focused on the Dominican Republic, uh, which is a country that has a really um, extensive health system and is really well staffed, but they're pretty under-resourced in a lot of ways and their health outcomes don't sort of match what you would expect a country at their kind of income level to achieve. So we approached it um, kind of from the perspective of seeing what might be causing those problems in the DR. Is there a need for more kind of information and can this device that we have kind of bridge those gaps? It's really easy to see the, the real applicability of this technology in this context. A lot of the doctors we talked to kind of saw how they could use it starting from day one as soon as they received it. So my project is currently about um, developing a comprehensive healthcare system for the country of Ghana using uh, ICT, which is in Information, Communications, and Technology. And this project essentially involves uh, creating a unique identification system for all Ghanaians, as well as creating a, a centralized database that stores patient records. So when I traveled with the team, the One Million Community Health Workers campaign team, last June uh, to Ghana, and uh, we visited the, the small village of Basome Freho, which is in the Ashanti region. And there we were able to meet and interact with a variety of community healthcare workers who are basically trained to and, and, and equipped to provide healthcare services to oftentimes poor and destitute people um, who don't have access to uh, major hospitals or healthcare centers in their area. And one of the findings uh, which I found particularly interesting was that we, by the end of the meeting and, and, and by the end of interacting uh, with the community healthcare workers, we found that there was a necessity to sort of revamp their entire infrastructure. The main challenge uh, that was encountered during the research was in terms of communications. So what we tried to do to mitigate this issue was to conduct weekly Skype sessions between our team at the Earth Institute and the teams in Ghana. And these Skype sessions were sort of tailored towards removing any sort of communication issues that existed between us, updating each other uh, with any new information from our ends, as well as continuing to discuss what can be done to move this project forward. So my research is within the field of disease ecology, and the project specifically is looking at the expansion of Lyme disease through the range expansion of the tick vector. And I'm particularly interested in how land use change impacts the movement of the tick through changes to the host community. The concern is that if there's an expansion of tick populations, there will be a higher risk of um, tick-borne diseases. So this map shows the presence of Lyme disease at the county level throughout the United States, and you can see here that there's hot spots both in the Midwest as well as the Northeast. And Lyme disease um, first emerged out of the Northeast in the 1980s and has since grown um, pretty rapidly. So during my PhD, I hope to um, gain an expertise in identifying emerging pathogens, and I see this contributing to my future as a wildlife researcher looking at um, impacts of health on wildlife at the interface of protected areas of development. I am extremely grateful to the financial support for my research. I think that it comes at an especially critical time as the future of scientific funding has become more uncertain. So I'm an Israeli and an aspiring environmentalist. 
and I, I take great pride in the fact that I, I had the opportunity to take 30 of my peers to my home country and to show them or learn with them how Israel has been tackling its environmental policy issues within the very complex geopolitical um, environment. My greatest challenge was to to design an experience that would not be biased, that would be nuanced enough for the students to, um, to, to build their own understanding of the situation on the ground. So Jerusalem now is entirely under Israeli, so Israeli sovereignty. However, it is very much demographically divided between East and West. So the East part is what we would call the Arab or the Palestinian part. And uh, we had a fascinating tour with two tour guides, one Israeli Jewish and the other Palestinian Arab. And they showed us East Jerusalem through those two different viewpoints. And it was just fascinating. I know it was a very strong experience for our, for our students, not only from a geopolitical perspective, but also from, you know, looking into issues like how do you handle water distribution? How do you handle um, uh, wastewater treatment in an environment that is disputed when everything that you put on the ground wouldn't be a statement? And how does it affect the local people? It is a story of people at the end of the day. My project was intended to explore a side of Egypt that many don't see. Egypt is often portrayed by the West as a country that's post-revolution, a revolution that attempted a democratic process but whose efforts were ultimately usurped by a military coup. Many foreigners have left Egypt since 2011 due to political instability and general economic decline. However, what we're not shown are the thousands of Chinese nationals who are moving to Egypt to seek opportunities for employment and are starting businesses there. So the Sino-Egyptian relationship is growing, not just on a macro level, but on a local level as well, which is what I intended to capture in my research. This intersection between the two societies marks a notable shift in the global development pattern, and I'm eager to continue researching that as I've been able to in this project. The most interesting finding of my project was recognizing the potential that Chinese-owned restaurants have in fostering better relations and goodwill between Chinese and Egyptians on the ground in Cairo. These local immigrant-owned restaurants are facilitating cultural exchange, and they really highlighted the potential of food institutions to mitigate cross-cultural misunderstandings. This research really taught me the essential skills to conduct quality ethnographic research. My project was an ethnography of the edu everyday educational practices of a group of people living in a neighborhood and marketplace in Mexico City. When I was living in Mexico, a lot of people would tell me that this neighborhood was a place that didn't have education, so I became very quickly interested in what that meant. And it certainly meant that there were students, people who weren't enrolled in school, but it had a bigger there, there were discourses about how the neighborhood was seen in the city and in the country. And I wanted to see how to respond to these deficits and look at everyday educational practices as something productive and complex and ongoing in the neighborhood. This is still a project that uh, I'm very close to, and it will certainly uh, be something that I turn into journal articles. I've already presented at a number of conferences some of, uh, some of the findings, and I think beyond uh, strictly academic findings, it's something that I hope in working with these people will have a positive impact uh, in their lives and in, in general ways that this, this neighborhood is perceived. This is a piece of research that I would not have been able to undertake without this funding. And I think in the Earth Institute itself, this line of research helps expand the perspective and the types of research happening uh, within the organization. My project is about um, 
understanding community concerns and conflicts around this one gold mine in Tanzania. So I went to the communities, conducted some interviews, talked to them about how they used their natural resources, how they viewed the mine, what the corporate relations were. Um, and through that, I can kind of put those concerns within the frame of environmental conflict. Um, for example, political conflict, natural resource conflict, um, in order to kind of better inform corporate mining policies towards the community around it. I found actually going to Tanzania and talking to people the most rewarding part about my research because as much as I'm interested in the subject, to actually be able to really speak to people who have been affected by the issues that I'm studying, kind of bring projects to life and having uh, villagers offer me like some maize as I spoke to them, um, hearing Swahili around me, um, and really immersing myself into kind of the daily life of um, the village was really an incredible experience. We grew cultures of Heterosigma akashiwa, which is a species of phytoplankton that forms harmful algal blooms um, at a range of PCO2 levels to see how they responded to ocean acidification. Um, this was meant to sort of simulate future ocean conditions that are expected to happen in the next 50 to 100 years as atmospheric PCO2 rises. Um, and so we monitored their uh, physiology and um, uh, production of a potential toxin, um, hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, uh, as they grew at these different PCO2 levels um, to compare whether they were growing faster or growing slower at different levels of CO2. We monitored their carbon per cell and nitrogen per cell as well to see um, if they were storing um, uh, nutrients and elements in the environment differently at different PCO2 levels, uh, which could affect their nutritional value in the ecosystem and also how big they grow. We found that Heterosigma akashiwo seems to have a sort of growth optimum um, around 600 to 900 parts per million of CO2. So right now we're at approximately 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. So uh, in 50 to 100 years, as the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere continues to rise, this species is expected to grow faster and better, um, potentially meaning that they would form uh, more frequent and bigger harmful algal blooms, which would be problematic not only for the fish that they're killing in the environment, but also for human economies that depend on those fish. So my project was about looking at the interconnections between peace, sustainable peace and security and the involvement of women and girls at all levels of peacemaking, peace building, and peacekeeping around the world. I actually started working on this project while I was researching climate change and sustainability and disaster risk reduction, and I realized that climate change and climate re related extreme events like floods, droughts, um, hurricanes, they have major implications for peace and security. But what was even more shocking is the realization that you can't have either not sustainable peace and not sustainable development without the full and equal part participation of women and girls at all levels. So during my research, I came across some really incredible statistics. One of the most startling ones was that there are 1.2 billion people in the world right now who are living in fragility. That means that one-fifth of the world's population is being impacted by armed conflict, extreme poverty, political instability, and insecurity. And this is even more troubling when you think about the fact that 50% of all peace agreements that have been negotiated to date fail within the first 10 years. But then I found out that when you look at the 31 major peace processes that have happened since 1992 to 2001, you realize that women are only 2% of the chief mediators, they were only 3% of the negotiators, and only 4% of the signatories. Women and girls were either excluded or underrepresented during these negotiations. And so it's unsurprising that these peace processes were not sustainable. I had the opportunity to meet with top diplomats, with local peace organizers and community activists. And all of these people are working diligently, day in and day out, to ensure that there is sustainable peace within their communities, because that has a multiplier effect for peace around the world.
project is Solar Energy Initiative. Um, it's focused on um, contributing to alleviating energy poverty in Ethiopia. Um, and so what we're doing is we're um, conducting a stakeholder analysis to understand the key players um, when it comes to solar powered irrigation technology implementation in Ethiopia. Um, and for us to map out this um, the players, their interactions, um, and come up with a viable option for an implementation strategy in a local community in Ethiopia. Solar irrigation um, is pretty much the use of uh, solar panels uh, in order to pump water out of, out of the ground uh, for farming purposes. We're currently planning um, a field trip to Ethiopia and we hope to achieve two things. The first being uh, we'll have stakeholder meetings with the key players in the solar irrigation technology sector of Ethiopia and these will include financial institutions, government bodies, um, private sector suppliers as well as NGOs. Um, and the second portion of our field trip will consist of site visits where we will be visiting the places where our partners have uh, implemented solar irrigation um, technologies. And the point of that would be for us to first understand and what challenges farmers are facing uh, currently uh, by using the solar irrigation technologies and also what the benefits have been. Um, and then secondly, to raise awareness amongst farmers who haven't yet adopted uh, solar irrigation technologies um, so we can increase their understanding of the value of the technology. Overall, we're hoping to come out with a stakeholder analysis um, and that analyzes the different, maps out the different key players within the current uh, solar irrigation sector of Ethiopia so that this model can be used by future organizations or entities that are interested in um, enhancing the use of solar irrigation in Ethiopia. My research project is about uh, the levels to which youth understand peace for themselves and their nation of Myanmar and how they are participating in the peace process of their nation. And this past summer I went to Myanmar to conduct research with youth um, and their uh, involvement in the peace process. For the past 60 years the Burmese government has perpetrated uh, conflict in all forms of society, especially in the education system. So my research really focuses on understanding the experiences of youth from um, their time in the Myanmar national school system and how those experiences relate to conflict and peace building and how we can restructure that institution to cultivate more peace so that the youth of Myanmar can view themselves as um, national, multicultural, multi-ethnic citizens um, in addition to the citizens of their own ethnic groups.